Hello, everybody. My name is Alexandre Lieben. I'm the vice president of Astina and the chapter head of the Pacific South chapter. And it's my particular pleasure to welcome Martin Rauchbauer today, a good friend who has done really exciting work that he's going to share with us today. Martin is the founder of the Tech Diplomacy Network in San Francisco and the executive um, director of the Jurassi Resident Artists Program in Woodside. He works at the intersection of diplomacy, arts, technology, and the environment. For two years, he was Austria's first tech ambassador in Silicon Valley because he is an Austrian diplomat. For more than five years, he was the head of Open Austria and the Austrian Council in San Francisco. In all of those, through all of those different positions and roles, he helped shape the emerging field of tech diplomacy engaged in transatlantic digital diplomacy and digital human rights. He also developed digital humanism as a strategic focus of Austrian foreign policy. We welcome him today and look forward to his talk entitled Technology is the Message, How Tech Diplomacy is Transforming the International System. Welcome, Martin. Thank you so much, uh, Alexandra. And uh, thank you so much for all of you who made it uh, to this uh, meeting uh, on Zoom, uh, talking about uh, something that is, of course, very dear to my heart and increasingly to many other colleagues uh, in the field of diplomacy, tech diplomacy, uh, and talking a little bit about something that I would define as a practice uh, that is uh, slowly developing a sound conceptual basis of what it is that tech diplomats have been doing for a while now. And that uh, also leads me to maybe just add to the very kind introductory words uh, of Alexandra, uh, since this is in the context of Asina, a network of, of scientists and researchers that I highly admire. I do not consider myself as, as a researcher or a scientist or, or an academic, but the, as a practitioner, a career diplomat, in fact, uh, working on this intersection uh, of the practice that I care uh, most about and where I've uh, kind of uh, worked a lot in the last years, uh, and that is uh, technology on the one hand, uh, but also the cultural diplomacy, cultural um, management, uh, and the arts. And in fact, uh, right now, uh, I am still uh, in the Bay Area. You see behind me uh, the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, I still work here uh, exactly on this intersection uh, of the arts, culture uh, and technology. On the one hand, as executive director of an artist in residency program. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, I work uh, with uh, the colleagues uh, in the Tech Diplomacy Network. And I want to talk about this uh, latter um uh, activity uh, today, uh, which, however, will at some point uh, also uh, overlap uh, with my other uh, passion and practice, uh, the culture and the arts. So I will now uh, start uh, with a short presentation. I've prepared um, a few slides on that. Uh, so my talk today is uh, going to be uh, on uh, technology um, and diplomacy, the intersection uh, between the two. Um, and I've titled, uh, I gave kind of the title, how um, technology is the message, how tech diplomacy is transforming um, the international system. And this is for me important, um, this reference to McLuhan, uh, just to say that technology is not, uh, in my view, just a tool uh, that is at the disposal of dip diplomacy. I I think there are many, many layers uh, in which technology uh, is informing the international system and therefore uh, is also um, a, a reality uh, in the work uh, of diplomats uh, today. Um, there are four uh, shifts uh, encompassed uh, by the rise of tech diplomacy. Um, the one is that there are uh, new topics on the diplomatic uh, agenda that have somehow to do with technologies and not only digital technologies, but also um, 
biotechnologies. If you if you think of uh, the kind of aspects uh, in the during the global uh, pandemic um, that were um, had to do with somehow understanding also the scientific basis, the technological responses, and of course also. Um, the diplomatic uh, aspects uh, in the international system. There's kind of a form of non-digital um, um, aspects of new technologies. Of course, there are new uh, topics when it comes to security. Traditionally, security is an um, is very very high uh, on the agenda of diplomats. And of course, now that we are in the cyberspace, cybersecurity has become one of the new uh, topics, I would say, over the last uh, five to 10 years. Uh, but there are many, many others, and I'm going to talk about them uh, later on. Uh, there are new venues of engagement. Traditionally, diplomats um, uh, operate in centers of political power. Uh, but uh, tech diplomacy, interestingly, emerged uh, in a I would say center of economic power um, in the San Francisco Bay Area, so which is not even the capital of the state of California, which is in Sacramento, quite far away. Uh, but it, the San Francisco Bay Area, or what is generally called the Silicon Valley, um, is um, kind of a center of many of the headquarters of big uh, global pl platforms where a lot of decisions are made that uh, affect uh, the entire world. Uh, there are uh, also new actors uh, in the international field. Uh, traditionally, um, diplomacy is defined by the Westphalian system of nation states uh, that evolved kind of uh, over the last hundred years uh, and really is about, is a technique, is a tool, is an instrument that nation states have in order to um, manage uh, their relations. Uh, and uh, of course, we have, uh, it's not new that there are new actors. Uh, there are also non-state actors. This concept is not new to, to, to international relations, but tech diplomacy is a, is a reaction to a very uh, specific new non-state actor. And I would say that's the private sector uh, in technology. Big tech companies primarily uh, that sometimes act almost like nation states in terms of their um, economic power. Some of the revenues of the big uh, tech platforms uh, surpass uh, the GDP of small to medium-sized states, but also in the kind of decision-making power that are very often not only economic, but also political that some of these um, big players have, but even the mid mid-sized small players to, to the fact that they sometimes grow very, very fast or that they develop a technology that has a global impact need to be calculated in this kind of new actors. These new actors are, don't act uniformly. They don't always have the same interest. Uh, therefore, it is sometimes a little bit superficial to say the tech industry is thinking as if they were one uniform actor. They have very, very different ways of acting sometimes um, against each other in competition, sometimes in they align uh, with nation states and sometimes they oppose them. And then, of course, uh, tech diplomacy is also in the very kind of concrete way, a new form of representation um, by traditional diplomatic actors. Historically, and we kind of go through that um, the term came into use, uh, I would say, around five to six years ago, um, very, very visibly in 2017, when the Danish government appointed um, a tech ambassador to Silicon Valley. Some people at the time thought, was this a publicity stunt? Uh, what does that really mean, a tech ambassador? Um, but very, very um, soon after, other countries, including Austria, also started to develop um, not only uh, titles, uh, but also a practice that corresponded uh, to what the Danish were trying to achieve. Um, other uh, countries followed very, very soon. The European Union uh, in 2022 opened an office uh, for the first time uh, in San Francisco, also corresponding to this kind of new need. Uh, it was also a new step uh, for the European Union, a new need to enter into dialogue with the private sector and explaining what the EU uh, was doing uh, in terms of, of course, mainly tech policy um, uh, in the digital and technological, in, in, the, in the technology field. So the EU uh, also being a new 
uh, actor in the tech diplomacy field. What are, when we say technology, of course, is a, is a, a, a very, very long and big uh, word and concept. Of course, we are talking mainly about technologies uh, that are uh, pioneering, that are new, that are frontier uh, technologies, that are technologies that usually open up spaces that not are not entirely defined, um, that maybe create new markets, that create sometimes the need of either self-regulation or governmental regulation that pose new challenges to society, to the institutions, democratic institutions, as well as other multilateral institutions uh, that base, but sometimes even go deeper and uh, pose philosophical questions about uh, what it means uh, to be a human being. So we're talking about these kind of frontier technologies that we um, have seen emerging uh, over the last uh, 10 years, whether it is artificial intelligence and newest form of it in generative AI, robotics, um, virtual reality, mixed reality, um, quantum technology is one of those technologies that diplomats now increasingly engage because um, of the mainly claims and promises uh, that this uh, technology uh, brings for the uh, solution of to many of the planet's problem, uh, problems, but also um, as a potential uh, problem um, if, if uh, some of these claims will become true. So when we talk about uh, tech diplomacy, um, we do not only talk about the sphere of the digital, we talk about frontier technologies um, and the centers of the private sector, the headquarters of the private sector, what we call kind of the innovation ecosystems and their main hubs, therefore also become the locations, the geographic locations of where the tech diplomats mainly operate. Why tech diplomacy? Um, because the global tech industry, as I said, has emerged as a new actor in international relations, technological and digital uh, transformation has an impact not only on our institutions, but on our values as well, our norms, and, as, and also the geopolitical landscape. Uh, this practice has emerged historically in Silicon Valley as a nation field for practitioners representing government, civil society, and, and the global tech companies uh, has now, uh, and I will go into that, uh, spread out, is not only practiced in in, in in the San Francisco Bay Area, but has spread out to different uh, hubs. Uh, and also governments need to collaborate with each other and the private sector in shaping a global governance framework for frontier technology. So this realization, it's a realization that comes from the government side, but it's also a realization that comes from the private sector side that is calling on governments, on nation states uh, to collaborate, to interfere, to provide frameworks of, of global governance of some of these um, of some of these frontier technologies. Uh, what is uh, tech diplomacy? I said tech diplomacy has been a practice now for a while in search of its own uh, conceptual uh, frameworks. Um, so there's been several attempts to define it. Uh, we are uh, defining it um, at the Tech Diplomacy Network very loosely as a new tool in international relations between nation states and now new, the private sector and other stakeholders, uh, mainly civil society, um, but also individual citizens to collaborate in the fields of AI, cybersecurity, quantum computing, biotech, Web3 and others, and work on shaping global policy frameworks and on tackling common planetary uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. Uh, when we say it shapes values, I think it is sometimes very helpful to work um, as a diplomat kind of uh, in the kind of deeper way on what are these kind of values that you base your, te your tech diplomacy approach. Um, and we at the Austrian Foreign Ministry um, at the time uh, take, took resource to, to recourse uh, to the concept of digital humanism. Uh, digital humanism um, is when it comes, uh, you know, to the field of uh, foreign policy, um, it is the kind of uh, concerns uh, with developments that deeply affect our human values. When we think of algorithmic uh, decision making and its roles, uh, potential roles that, 
but also actual already realized roles in um, in the military, in 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 the weapons um, industry and their applications, in the, in, in in drone warfare. Um, and human decision making or non-human decision making, we understand that this has um, an immediate impact on in, on the in international security. And the kind of concepts we need to apply to it are very very impactful and have a very concrete reality. Uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems, uh, whether uh, or, and the degree of autonomy they have, and the, the the question of how human beings are involved in the decision making, of course, uh, they are very very crucial. Uh, there's also this idea, as the Israeli historian Harari pointed out, uh, to these new technologies that there's a secret desire to end human finiteness, um, that there's actually like a, a desire in them when we think of artificial uh, intelligence and some of the promises and claims uh, of singularity that this is to, to end our uh, human finiteness. So that's, of course, um, posing a challenge to traditional concepts of human uh, autom uh, autonomy. Therefore, you need a kind of very sound um, um, value base uh, in order to uh, tackle with some of the claims and promises that these new frontier technologies um, provide. And very concretely, of course, there's also a challenge to how um, uh, these applications of some of these frontier technologies directly affect our human rights, particularly in the digital uh, sphere. So there's a, a, um, a strong um reaction, a strong need, a strong urgency for countries that care a lot about human rights to make sure that in the digital sphere, uh, their application um, uh, is also guaranteed according to international norms, universal norms and standards. And then, of course, there's another uh, big fear, uh, and that is the question of substitution of human activities uh, through uh, automation, the question um, of uh, how these new technologies are going to affect um, our workforce and whether or not um, many of the activities that we do, uh, including diplomacy itself, um, wh whether or not they will be replaced through automation. Um, I remember um, the Chinese AI expert Kai Fu Li. He once put on his webpage um, a kind of uh, a, a, a kind of prompt where you could put in your profession, um, and uh, it, it basically predicted, that was three or four years ago, um, whether or not this profession would be replaced by AI. And I, of course, put in diplomat and then, and then it said that it was very unlikely that it would ever be replaced. Um, I'm not so sure about that. I think uh, we have been surprised. Um, he also said that uh, creative uh, the artists uh, would never be replaced. That's the one sphere that is... Um, uh, reserved uh, to human activities. I'm not so sure through the recent uh, developments um, in a generative AI, whether this mon human monopoly on creativity will hold up forever. But of course, that's one of that's delving right into um, the uh, contemporary uh, debates. Um, uh, but I, I'm just saying it is uh, good to have a kind of foundational a conceptual basis uh, which, which you guide uh, your foreign policy in this digital uh, realm and digital humanism uh, for us in the Austrian case um, was kind of the basis of kind of the umbrella concept with which we um, uh, then thought of our different um, specific foreign policy realms. There's also a tradition in Austria uh, to talk about digital humanism in the city of Vienna um, the, um, in 2019, was a group of um, scientists, technologists, um, <laughs> the university or the Technical University of Vienna that published the Vienna Manifest on Digital Humanism. And in this manifest, you can see there's strong uh, concerns of human rights, specifically privacy uh, and freedom of speech. Of course, worry about how democratic institutions are affected uh, by some of some of the digital technologies strong um, urge for regulations and effective laws and um, also concern with the mod with um, the tendency of these big scale uh, digital platforms to form monopolies so digital humanism also um, as a conceptual movement um, that that um, is very strongly um, associated uh, to Austria now uh, while I felt that digital humanism uh, was a very um, important um, conceptual basis for tech diplomacy. I also don't want to hide that there are kind of challenges to that idea, particularly when you think um, of the environment um, 
uh, and some of the damages, some of the challenges um, that are caused by us, the Anthropocene. Um, so uh, I'm just p putting here, uh, if digital humanism is very often symbolized by kind of a digital representation of the Vitruvian uh, man by Leonardo da Vinci, um, putting the human in the center of everything also m maybe has its downsides. Uh, and in, I think in 2011, the artist John Quigley um, projected the Vitruvian man on, on, on a melting um, ice cap uh, and kind of said, okay, so, so this is also some of the effects of putting the human uh, in the center. Uh, so digital humanism has also its its problems, its challenges. For us, um, when in my old function at Open Austria, um, we also saw digital humanism as a um, way to uh, also engage um, the culture and the arts, cultural diplomacy. We even coined the term of cultural tech diplomacy as an important um, element where we kind of bring artistic thinking, philosophical thinking uh, into technology in a very interesting way uh, to engage as diplomats uh, through our artists and the art world. And we help together with um, our colleagues from um, other um, kind of European countries. We, we at the time founded a platform called The Grid, uh, which was really trying to bring artists, uh, technologists, uh, and even at some point policymakers uh, together. Uh, so including the artists uh, in the pictures, because we believe that art uh, powers uh, technology. Um, there's also another element that we then uh, did very concretely. Uh, we um, brought the Freedom Online Coalition uh, an organization of like-minded countries, I think it's about 34, 35 countries um, that have a strong uh, conviction um, that digital human rights in the internet need to be defended. Uh, and we uh, kind of said, okay, but we need to also connect uh, this uh, idea with the private sector. Uh, and we brought, um, at, at, there was a big annual conference of the Freedom Online Coalition in Accra, um, in Africa, and we there decided um, as countries to bring the Freedom Online Coalition uh, to Silicon Valley and to establish a very concrete local dialogue um, with the private sector. So this is a very concrete example um, of tech diplomacy in action. And there's now the Freedom Online Coalition's Silicon Valley work, working group that regularly um, uh, talks about uh, digital human rights with private sector um, representatives. One more thing, Open Austria was founded in 2016 um, as legally speaking as, an, as a consulate, kind of was a hybrid between a diplomatic mission uh, and innovation hub um, together with the Austrian uh, Trade Commission and at some point also the Austrian Business Agency functioned as an innovation hub but also as very, very soon developed um, tech diplomacy as one of its main uh, pillars um, I, I also um, I want to quickly uh, point to the mission of Open Austria as a focus point for entrepreneurs, startups, scientists, research, such as policymakers and creative minds. So this very interdisciplinary approach, uh, which uh, innovation, of course, needs um, and is the basis of the success of Silicon Valley to create uh, innovative new uh, technologies. Uh, and we kind of mirrored that in our mission by saying, okay, we, we have an interdisciplinary approach here to this diplomacy, but also to our um, stakeholders and bring them uh, to Silicon Valley. Um, another aspect, I think historically speaking about tech diplomacy is that it is when we think of said it, it, it happened historically 2016, uh, 2018, uh, this is kind of also the time of the tech clash, um, a, a term I think coined by the economist as a reaction to a certain uh, things that happened in technology. Um, if, if we think of the Cambridge Analytica scandal, uh, 2018 was also the year uh, GDPR went into force, the, uh, the, um, the, 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 the digital um, uh, data protection law of the European Union. At the same time, Mark Zuckerberg had to testify in front of the US Congress as well as in front of um, the European Parliament, which was very, very uh, symbolic um, in terms of uh, this kind of euphoria that had accompanied um, uh, Silicon Valley for many, many years. And the tech boom was really followed by a 
skepticism in many societies, Western societies, but I would say globally um, around some of the dark sides, some of the downsides um, of uh, particularly social media and, 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 and the platforms, which led to the tech clash. If you then go on and say, okay, the global pandemic, um, of course, in some ways strengthened um, the global platforms, but made us aware of their power even more so and led to even a more urgency to create a regulatory frameworks in a global kind of way. And where we now, I think we are now at the same time uh, experiencing an economic downturn um, uh, also of the tech industry. Um, a lot of jobs have been uh, shed um, uh, uh, by these uh, global platforms. Um, and at the same time, maybe, you know, this is just a cyclical uh, element uh, many um, uh, companies now are banking on a generative AI as the next new big thing uh, that would kind of reshape the tech industry, uh, but therefore, of course, also reshape um, society, reshape um, our democratic institutions, and therefore there's absolute need uh, for dialogue between the private sector and governments. So um, very, very click quickly, Digital humanism as the conceptual basis, tech diplomacy as um, the uh, new uh, tool uh, in international relations. I'm just asking maybe this um, can, uh, you know, in the future lead to this idea of planetary diplomacy, meaning um, uh, a diplomacy that uh, is seen as a useful a tool for some of the big planetary challenges which cannot be solved uh, by nation states alone as a new conceptual uh, kind of basis rather than mere digital humanism uh, plan the planetary um uh you know in terms of um uh, the digital uh, challenges uh, that uh, the planet faces, but of course also the 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 the, the challenges uh, faced by climate change, um, the 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 challenges faced um, by max mass species extinction, uh, pollution, um, and an increasing ideological uh, polarization um, and geopolitical divisions, and therefore maybe planetary uh, diplomacy. Um, could be a useful uh, tool for the future and diplomats therefore need to be preparing for that. This is at least um, a, one of the things that the late French philosopher Bruno Latour has, has, has said that we will uh, need diplomacy um, uh, even more so than we need it now uh, in order to settle, in order to reach uh, solutions for the upcoming planetary um, struggles and divisions. Uh, another uh, challenge to take diplomacy, I think, comes from ourselves. We, we in our, uh, as the Take Diplomacy Network, and you see on top here the logo of our, of our network, we kind of say um, we are just at the moment um, talking about tech diplomacy in these terms, but we truly think that the, the developments that we're describing and to which we want to find um, conceptual answers are so, so deep that in the future, um, all diplomacy will be tech diplomacy and therefore the tech kind of will be um, redundant. Um, I already said that the, the um, institution, the informal forms of collaboration between uh, tech diplomats, um, where the Freedom Online Coalition, which we as Open Austria initiated, another initiative that Open Austria um, spearheaded um, a few years ago was the Playground Initiative, where like-minded countries shared best practices. And those two, I think, paved the way uh, to the Tech Diplomacy Network, uh, which uh, we founded in February 2023, so that not that all, uh, uh, not that long ago, uh, and we basically put in one line our, as our tech lag that we want to connect technology uh, with the world. Uh, it's kind of a, there's an kind of ironic pun in it uh, because, of course, technology uh, and technology companies usually claim that it is them who connect the world together through digital platforms through uh, the digital infrastructure. But we are kind of saying, okay, what we are trying to do is connecting technology to which in some um, aspects has also been perceived um, and can be seen as a bubble. And we are connecting the world of technology um, with the rest of the world. So that we have three goals in the tech diplomacy net. We want to provide conceptual clarity, what tech diplomacy really is as a practice is 
it exists, but what is it conceptually? We want to create a community and we want to facilitate collaboration. Collaboration already happening. We want to facilitate it among other countries. Uh, we have as our mission uh, that we want to foster collaboration and dialogue between the diplomatic uh, community, civil society, and the tech industry in Silicon Valley and beyond. And I'm saying beyond because uh, we are now uh, planning to expand uh, to other hubs. Uh, the network organizes events, workshops, and provides a resource for diplomats looking to navigate the complex and rapidly changing world of technology. Uh, the events we did since uh, February, we had um, we have a big collaboration with the World Economic Forum, organized a huge conference uh, on generative AI, uh, which with the title Agency for AI, uh, some of the debates that have been ongoing on whether an international agency that regulates um, uh, artificial intelligence is necessary, and if yes, how to conduct it, um, was co-organized by the Tech Diplomacy Network with other events. Um, as well, uh, most recently in the city of San Jose, uh, with the mayor of San Jose, we, we basically talked also um, about uh, Silicon Valley and how it needs to focus on uh, some of the new technologies that will be crucial in the future, mainly uh, uh, climate change and sustainability, uh, as well um, as the semiconductor industry, very important to the city of San Jose. Uh, and we kind of uh, had a dialogue with uh, private sector representatives there. Uh, the network aims to become a hub for the diplomatic community to exchange ideas and shares uh, best practices, but we also want to address uh, the digital gap that has been identified by the United Nations um, as the one excluding factor for many countries, particularly in the global south, um, that do not have the capacity to engage uh, on these new uh, uh, technology challenges. And therefore, we as Network Seed also as our mission to engage with countries, uh, provide strategic advice, capacity building and training together with our partners. We have um, initiated an online course on tech diplomacy together with the Diplo Foundation in Geneva, um, as well um, as concrete uh, strategic uh, advice uh, in an informal way with a number of countries that have come to us and has asked us, how does one engage with the private sector and how does one establish a mission of tech diplomacy in the Silicon Valley, in Silicon Valley or beyond? Uh, we uh, think that we will uh, promote international collaboration and understanding it in an interconnected world. And our main partners so far are on a conceptual level, the Begrün Institute in Los Angeles, the World Economic Forum Center of the Fourth Industrial Revolution can have very, very close uh, collaboration, particularly when it comes to um, global um, regulatory frameworks, the Diplo Foundation um, in Geneva and the Bay Area Economic Council, uh, basically industry representation uh, of Silicon Valley with whom we work very, very closely. We have a network of experts. If you go to our website, uh, you will see um, different uh, faces, different people, some of them diplomats, some of them scientists, some of them academics, some of them think tank representatives, some of them private sector representatives that developed a certain expertise and want to, for a certain amount of time, share that uh, with the wider community. We have a newsletter to which I um, uh, encourage you to sign up. Uh, um, on a monthly basis, we are on LinkedIn, uh, where we have in, in a really short time uh, gathered, um, by now it's, I think, 1,500 uh, followers uh, almost. Um, and we are planning uh, in a few weeks a time uh, to uh, establish a new presence on the East Coast, uh, particularly in the multilateral context of the UN. A tech Diplomacy Network is going to expand uh, to New York. Uh, in, in 2024, we, what we want to do is uh, also uh, uh, collaborate with the academic world, uh, and which should lead in the first uh, publication uh, on uh, tech diplomacy, which we will launch uh, in April of 2024. Uh, we will also reach out uh, to other um, uh, geographical um, regions as well as hubs um, around the world. Uh, we're thinking of uh, establishing a tech diplomacy prize um, and in 2025, uh, I think what we really would like to do, and this is our, our big um, aim, is to become a, a truly a global uh, platform uh, in uh, around the world, including in Asia, in South America, in Africa, uh, uh, and, and really uh, provide um, a hub uh, for our uh, community. 
Um, if you want to um, uh, sign up and follow our activities, you can do that um, by following our LinkedIn page uh, or going to our web page and signing up for our newsletter. Um, which we will have, as I said, on a, on a monthly basis. Uh, at the moment, we are based uh, in San Francisco, where we work with over 24 uh, countries that are represented and uh, basically engage uh, in tech diplomacy. But we truly think uh, that tech diplomacy uh, is ultimately something that affects every diplomat um, wherever and in what, wherever they work and in whatever field they work in the future. So this is my... Um, short or uh, well, not too short presentation on tech diplomacy and I'm very happy if you have any questions or comments um, to discuss them with you. Thank you very much, Martin. That was really fascinating. Um, I encourage everybody to think about questions. You can put them in the chat or ask them live. I would like to ask the first one, if I may. And that also comes out of the AI summit that just happened in, in uh, England, outside of London, Bletchley. Um, and it sort of follows, it's like you you mentioned Zuckerberg's testimony, read famous testimony before Congress and what a disaster that was. And everything sort of has grappled with the same question since. A global governance framework requires that people's understanding is on the same page, on the same level. And what we have seen is that policymakers don't understand, right? What, what engineers do, what different companies do, what different technologies actually mean. And that is the biggest challenge. And how do you propose to overcome that, right? Because in, in a way, it's like, I mean, I understand that you want to bridge different sort of help with that, like workshop, right? Help educate people along the way. But, but um, what's your proposal? How can we get to effective governance? We don't, we don't, you're muted. Yeah, sorry about that. No, I mean, this is one of the, um, I would say, defining uh, factors which um, originally also led uh, to this kind of ethos of Silicon Valley of self regulation, right? I mean, governments, as well intentioned as they, claim to be one, as soon as they interfere, um, they either don't understand the technology from, from the get go, or uh, they understand it too late. And the kind of solutions they come up with um, usually don't um, capture the newest de development because technology develops so fast. Uh, and I think um, there's a lot um, uh, to say about this. Um, uh, if, if you if you just think of when 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 I started out in Silicon Valley in 2016, there was already talk um, about uh, the EU uh, attempting to draft uh, an ad for the first time um, of, of a big um, country or a big group of countries uh, to draft uh, a legislation on artificial intelligence, the, the famous EU AI Act. And we were actually very involved there as a group of European countries um, to get a private sector perspective, uh, the kind of multi-stakeholder approach to invite the leading uh, companies at the time. And OpenAI was one of them, um, you know, and say, okay, if we regulate AI, how would we need to regulate it? Um, and it is uh, kind of funny that uh, uh, when the EU AI Act was almost about to be passed uh, this year, then uh, this generative AI uh, wave happened and everybody said, well, this, this is completely not included and we need to uh, either not pass it or completely um, relaunch it. So that's the one story. I, I would add to it that uh, I personally was uh, often... Um, uh, involved in a complaint, not so much by the big companies, but interestingly enough, by the small and medium-sized companies, as sometimes Austrians that would then come to us and say, you know, uh, this regulation coming from the EU claims at uh, targeting the big uh, monopolistic uh, digital platforms, but as an unintended consequence, it's actually just raising the market entry barrier for us, the small ones. So that was another uh, um, complaint we often heard about regulations in general. Um, however, I, I, I would say the other side of the story is not only that uh, policymakers um, uh, have 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 kind of um, uh, upped their game and have um, 
you know, uh, also learned a lot. I think um, there's also, um, I, I would say, the, the nature of technological progress also is cyclical. So sometimes new technologies take a while and then their application, then there's that time for their applications um, and uh, of, of, of some groundbreaking breaking, um, new developments. And we've, we've seen also that governments are actually quite capable of regulating a new te- te- technologies. If we just think of um, new, new technologies that happen in the bio, in the biotechnology sphere, in the, in the medical sphere, where we all clearly know that they need to be uh, regulated because they provide high value, but they also provide high risk. Um, we do trust that government agencies, um, you know, over the while, they, they're not always perfect, uh, but we, we, we've acknowledged there's a consensus in society that high risk areas um, of technology need to be regulated uh, and that governments can provide pretty good frameworks that are never perfect, that need to be updated, that need to be, there need to be sunset clauses and so on, but there needs to be a regulation. I think that's the, that's the risk, which I personally prefer. It's, that's the approach which I personally prefer, which is really based on the concept of, of risk assessment. You need to look at where the risks are, assess them, um, and provide a kind of uh, regulatory frameworks that provide clarity for the companies. Therefore, international cooperation is important because you cannot, from the, the point of view of a, of a, of a company, have a, like a patchwork of different regulations. Um, so... Therefore, international collaboration is important. Hence, tech diplomacy can be useful there as well, um, as well as um, there needs to be also the flexibility. These regulations um, have a contempt- have a, a temporary nature and need to be uh, constantly updated. That would be my approach. Makes sense. Olaf? Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's really one of the key topics I think we're facing, right? Uh, to manage that kind of... Uh, developments but you know if, if i have i work a lot with large corporations right and in innovation architectures and stuff like that and if you talk to people everybody seems to say that europe is a laggard in kind of innovation because of uh, too much digital re- uh, regulation gdpr of course being one of the biggest examples and you've got on the other end of the spectrum china you know that does a very different ball game, right? Uh, also, then again, as the U.S., how do you see that play out? You know, because it's really these three. I don't, we don't know how the global south eventually will develop, but these three, you know, forces that have very different trajectories when it comes to dealing with AI. Um, and uh, you know, Austria being a small player here, Europe actually being a small player here. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you said it out. This this is the situation. You have um, the U.S. and China uh, kind of engaged in this uh, geopolitical uh, competition. That's a very broad stroke um, picture um, that is often painted uh, too broadly. Um, but it is, of course, we 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 do see. I mean, geopolitical um, divisions and, and and sometimes are exactly broad broad strokes. Uh, and of course, they're. People talking, is this where we are now uh, heading to? Uh, is this kind of a new Cold War, which is going to be defined by technology uh, to a large extent? Um, yeah. And um, and if we think, if, if we try to understand this new reality through the lens of the Cold War uh, and a polarized world dominated by the US and China, where does that leave? Um, that's, of course, the question the rest of the world. At the EU, um, I think, um, level, and this is, Again, very, very broad stroke. Um, uh, I think in terms of um, its values, um, uh, and of course, it's also existing alliances uh, probably feels in the big picture very strongly aligned uh, to the United States. Um, but yes, there are also these two factors um, that you mentioned. There is um, the EU um, also has the feeling that um, it has not managed to develop um, a very strong uh, industrial um, base uh, for some of these new technologies by itself, an ecosystem of AI, how do you build that uh, on the one hand? On the other hand, um, the EU has managed, I don't think it is a small player at all when it comes to um, uh, providing regulatory solutions. Sometimes they're, they're even copied by um, other parts of the world. I would say when it comes to privacy uh, protection, um, 
as imperfect as the GDPR is, and I would say I, when you talk to EU officials, they tell you, we know, you know, that, that it, it's not it's not great uh, GDPR. It particularly creates regulatory burden for small and medium-sized uh, companies and, and therefore um, entrance barriers. That's a fact. However, um, uh, we also know that it has kind of become something of an international standard. I remember uh, when GDPR um, went into force in 2018, it was a large source of inspiration for what was happening here in California, uh, the C California Consumer and, and um, Privacy Act um, that kind of developed in a different way, uses different languages, different instruments, but they were, of course, looking um, at Europe and what came out of Brussels uh, and tried to align itself. And GDPR, of course, also has clauses uh, that think of how does this piece of legislation interact um, with other um, uh, um, international um, regulations in, in its kind of adequacy uh, regulations. So I think the EU um, is right uh, to uh, be self-confident and to regulate um, I think where the EU needs to um, think differently um, is how to create its own um, ecosystem that can compete. I don't think that they are in necessarily uh, a, a contradiction. I think you can have a strong regulatory um, rea um, basis and reality and still be very highly competitive. Uh, and then in the geopolitical uh dimension of your question, I think the interesting part is going to be um, the non-European uh, world, what you said, the global south, but I think countries that are um, kind of on the fence, that are that are not clearly aligned with the West or clearly aligned with China, those are the, it's very, very interesting to interact with such countries. I don't want to name anybody, but when, when we at the, at the net, in, in the net, within the network or um, as the network um, have conversations with such countries, the kind of reality they're facing, the kind of pressure they're facing to, to, to pick sides, you know, to choose are very, very interesting. And, and this is this is happening as we speak, that kind of geopolitical um, confrontation, uh, particularly in those countries. I would call them on the fence uh, that don't want to choose sides and they want to keep their options open. Yeah. Peter, you want to say something? I just wanted to, can I quickly just add just a brief comment without discussion then to get Dietrich then? But you know, one of the key challenges is that these days competitiveness is driven by ecosystem engagement. Ecosystems require digital infrastructures that are based on free data sharing. And, and there's a lot of stuff where you just then become a kind of a lagger where you have it competitive that really comes to driving because this kind of technologies are driving so much of growth. It's, it's just as, as a comment, right? Uh, and I didn't want to be brief because you had the hand up. Yeah, thank you, um, Martin. Fascinating talk. Um, I have a, probably a two part question. Um, the one is 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 more what I would be interested in is in your path because I remember your, your personal path and your role here because I remember you're this uh, you know discussing in, in LA that you refer to yourself as a, as a former diplomat that you're not that when you you you, you used to be basically not, you know representative of of, of of Austria but now you transitioned into into this new role so so, so I would like to learn a little bit about your path there what uh, you know how how uh, how you made that choice. And, and what your role is. And, and the second part of that is actually probably also gets a little bit to Julia's question, yeah. at least on the, on the tangent, is that in networks, and I've seen that in Asina, you know, you have, you know, who, who, are, who is part of networks, right? I, I could see in a tech diplomacy network, for example, that you have different stakeholders as part of your network. So you can have governments or your companies, you know, scientists, artists, uh, um, you know, some of them come with their own mission. If you're a representative of Austria in a network, then you have a certain, you know, mission that you have to um, you know, represent there. How do you, how do you, how do you bring these different voices together um uh you know to make sure that that it is not tipping in one direction that you're not not taken hostage by by, by very strong you know um uh, advocates of of, of 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 a certain element to um to to ensure that you're following your overall mission well well yeah that's that those are all really really great questions and i i'm also now uh reading uh julia's question which i will also try to integrate when it comes to my personal path um I, 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 I've been for, for kind of many decades, um, uh, an Austrian career diplomat and I 
took a leave of absence from the Austrian foreign ministry, um, what we call Karenzierung. Um, uh, after I left Open Austria, um, uh, with with the intention to um, use um, the the kind of freedom, you know, that I'm now not exactly working for the government uh, to explore the kind of uh, questions uh, I encountered in my practical work um, and to think them through in a kind of deeper uh, and free awake and also kind of think also from different perspectives, not only look at the Austrian perspective or even the European perspective. Um, and that has been very, very rewarding for me. I think um, in general that tech diplomacy is rewarding for everybody, I think uh, particularly uh, also for the colleagues who are tech diplomats working for governments because it is not yet defined, because it is a practice that is um, looking for its um, kind of definitions, for its um, protocols, for its um, ways and practices, because uh, that that's actually a very privileged position where you, on the one hand, of course, you always represent your country's interests, but when you are witnessing that those interests are in flux and that they are, need to be defined. Um, this is a, a really very fascinating and very rewarding uh, moment. Um, so I think from a from a personal point of view, from a career point of view, I think it is great and it is very, very rewarding because it allows you to be part of a conversation that truly shapes um, um, an entire field. Uh, from the country's point of view, the other side of it is, of course, it, it, it also means since the things are not so defined, um, it also means uh, that um, uh, it also points to the actual challenges that these countries, all, that, that the countries face. Um, a, a bureaucracy wants to, uh, you know, have things defined, have, 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 it, have kind of very clear objectives, which then the bureaucracy implements. Um, and there, I think every country, and that includes Austria, are still are facing the, the challenge. How do you coordinate yourself within a, a, a ministry, within a country, within the different levels of governance? How do you coordinate that with the stakeholders um, that are the, the industry players? And I don't think that there is a, a, a perfect model like that, because also these these the, the whole situation, as we said, are changing constantly and are changing very, very fast. But what I liked about the Austrian approach was that it was kind of almost bottom up and kind of very flexible and very small, rather than, you know, working for 10 years on a big, big strategy that, that then had to be implemented at all costs. Um, so government, if they're agile, if they are kind of adopt a kind of bottom up, um, agile, um, approach and I think uh, Open Austria was therefore a, an interesting and successful models, which other countries looked at, um, is the way to go. Question of how do you uh, maybe uh, also how do you include the, the 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 stakeholders that I haven't touched because we talked about the private sector, we talked about the governments. What about civil society? Um, I think uh, first of all, civil society. Um, provides very, very interesting uh, additional challenges and aspects about it. If you think of the whole uh, debate surrounding Web3 and decentralized governance and the kind of various initiatives that are also thinking um, and, and uh, about how, how one can kind of conduct a decentralized uh, form of diplomacy, citizen diplomacy. Um, um, very, very interesting um, initiatives um, that are also in touch with them. I'm advising one of them, the People's Accords, that really try to, uh, they form the DAO and they're trying to um, uh, create kind of projects where the diplomats are the citizens and they, they kind of decide on whether to pursue a project or not in a kind of decentralized way. When it comes to artists, um, to, to Julia's point, which is, is this other passion I have, I think they need to be included um, because um, because the kind of questions that uh, new technologies bring up are, are, are often very much deeper than bureaucrats or 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 can handle um, and therefore we really need the humanities, the scientists, but also the artists uh, because they sometimes um, bring up new new ways of thinking, new new approaches um, that 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 kind of help us um, keep humane and um, uh, ultimately, um, I would say. Um, 
um, are, are absolutely ne necessarily for the future of humankind. Um, I think from a purely diplomatic um, perspective, there's also an additional pragmatic advantage to engage with artists. Uh, and that is that it's a not, usually not a very contentious field. You can, you, you know, we, you can, well, you have, when you have private sector and government representatives engage in a dialogue, the danger is that the positions are entrenched or that people just, you know, exchange banalities, but via the arts, which is traditionally a field of experimentation, thinking out of the box and kind of not outcomes, not outcome op open, it's not defined. Um, I think uh, that that is actually a very useful tool. And I, I always try to promote that uh, even when it comes to, to the field of, of diplomacy. Martin is like, you're right. I always thought about the nonpartisan nature of art, but also the the imagination, right? There's like here the different perspective you you addressed is like that are necessary to imagine a possible consequence, outcome, impact, all of this. That's why I thought it's like science fiction authors should always be part of any discussion and any table. Uh, we have one more question, and that is that concerns itself with self regulation. What's the what has been the problem really in your mind? with self-regulation of the industry itself? Yeah, I mean, the, pro the problem with self-regulation, there, there are many problems with self-regulations um, and, and there are also some advantages with self-regulation. Self-regulation has the advantage that the people that come up with self-regulations are the ones closest to the technology. They've invented it, they've developed it. That's the advantage of it. <laughs> the disadvantage of it is that of course um, a company it's, these are banalities, but they are very true and impactful. Obviously, it does not have the interest of the whole of society in its mind, whatever it claims, but has its own self-interest and its own baseline and, and business model in mind. And, and, and so it should be. It has to. It has, uh, therefore, kind of regulation it gives itself um, is, is a self-interested one. Uh, so that's one of the problems. Interestingly enough, self-regulation, however, um, is also has also been... Um, criticized from companies themselves, particularly whether this is because of competition. Uh, so uh, some companies would like to have government regulation in order to have a kind of fairness, uh, in order to break up monopolies, to create a level playing field for all players. Uh, and then there is another reason why self-regulation has come under attack, even by the big monopolistic um, uh, uh, platforms, because if you self-regulate, you are kind of also responsible. If you basically, as a company, need to define what a harm is, then you might be, you know, blamed. Uh, whereas if you kind of can shed that responsibility to the government, uh, you can kind of uh, also avoid uh, the, the, the being blamed uh, for 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 the for. It. So there is also that element which, which we shouldn't forget that um, companies also don't really like to when when they understood, um, particularly the social media sphere, what kind of impact their technology had on institutions, society, dem democracies. And there was, a, there was actually a, a genuine interest um, of, of the platforms not to, to have that kind of responsibility, but to rather transfer that uh, to governments. And these, all these factors uh, together um, have, made, have not made self-regulation redundant, but have, I think, led to a time which we're living where um, there's a general consensus that regulation is necessary. The question is, we, is it the right regulation? Do we have any more questions? Anybody else? My last question, like, do you find the tech companies to be willing participants in your efforts, in your work? I think that the and, tech uh, sorry, companies- Sorry, and, 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 and let me expand that. How about the scientists? Mm -hmm. um the I, I would say the tech uh, companies um are interested in participating um in in questions about reg regulation um because that's serious and affects the business line and they want to be part of that conversation for sure um are they always interested in engaging with diplomats 
depending on whether this is meaningful for the companies or whether this is just an exchange of niceties and 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 you know then then they're not interested so that's that's one of the challenges there's also a challenge within the internal structures of companies whether they themselves have the capacity to engage um with company with governments in this kind of diplomacy kind of way without this just being a pure marketing or or pr kind of exercise so also tech companies need to create capacity and because they're different departments, they're also bureau- bureaucracies. They have a trust and safety department, a government relations department, a PR department, a marketing, a product development. So who, who, who in the tech de- who in the tech company is interested? And then there's also these legal liabilities that makes often tech company representatives be much more formal and robotic in their in their conversations because they're so scared that they say something um, that that might be held against them. Whereas government representatives are often freer to talk. So there's that. So it, there's there's a lot of. Um, uh, in, in structural uh, challenges that also tech companies need to uh, overcome. When it comes to science, I think um, science um, is 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 of course there's there's always been this there's also a long long tradition um, of science diplomacy, um, and and uh, I would say science um, and scientists when it comes to the natural scientists when it comes to the humanities are obviously. Um, the the necessary par- partners uh, in terms of understanding the technology, in terms of communicating the technology, um, in terms of being ultimately diplo- diplo- engaged in di- di- diplomacy itself. I think that the presumptions of, of science diplomacy, that scientists often can talk on the basis of science, science and this is happening, for, for example, in the case of U.S. and the U.S. and China, you know, the AI scientists, they talk to each other. Um, uh, I think this that science plays an absolute crucial role in this um, in this uh, in, in the international uh, system um, uh, and tech diplomacy. Anything else? Anybody? But this was fascinating. This is really, really good. So thank you very much. <laughs> we'll meet again. I was like, and see how this all evolves. But uh, thank you for your time. It was really wonderful to have you. And everybody, thank you for joining us today. Um, and we'll see you soon. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Thanks.